Good evening. Wonderful to see so many of you here interested in this very lively debate tonight. Uh, this is the uh, 13th Annual Educational Law and Social Justice Forum. Uh, it is sponsored by the Journal of Educational Controversy and the uh, Center for Education, um, Equity, and um, Diversity. I always <laughs> uh, better known as SEED. Um, by the way, I want to ex express my thank you to all of the SEED staff and to Dr. Uh, French for all their hard work, um, and also to my editorial assistant, Guava Jarden, who's fooling around with the lights right now, I think. <laughs> Um, whoops. <laughs> the, uh, tonight's uh, um, forum is also being co-sponsored by the uh, Whatcom County chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union of uh, Washington State. And I'd just like to take a brief moment to, uh, uh, to invite you to our event next Wednesday evening. We have uh, invited the ACLU to come and do a special workshop called Civil Rights in Schools 101. Uh, and uh, Linda Mangle, who is the equity director and the uh, staff attorney for the ACLU, is going to talk about a whole set of issues including uh, bullying and uh, cyberbullying and uh, discipline, uh, truancy issues, free speech issues. So it covers a whole range and we'd like to invite you to join us. It's in the seat, and again, it's at 5.30. Um, we started the Educational Law and Social Justice Forum 13 years ago uh, in order to provide a public forum for both the local community as well as the university community uh, to come together and discuss some of the contemporary and controversial issues uh, in education. And uh, tonight, we're going to address a topic that we've discussed a lot on our blog. The Journal of Educational Controversy has a, a, a blog attached to it. Uh, we've discussed it a lot on our blog. We also have, by the way, position statements by each of our panelists. So after the uh, forum, if you want to take a look at uh, what uh, their positions are in writing, uh, I invite you to take a look at our, our blog. Uh, of course, it's also a topic that has been widely discussed in the national uh, media. Uh, across the nation, there's been a growing anti-union movement, uh, especially uh, against public sector uh, or public employee unions. And of course, teacher unions are part of the public sector unions. The, um, at least those who are part of the public school system. And uh, you probably have seen a lot of the uh, efforts to uh, actually strip away collective bargaining rights from, from teachers, from public uh, employees uh, in Wisconsin and uh, in Ohio. and uh, They've been pretty visible on the television. Uh, but there's also been movements of, uh, in similar degree, in uh, different degrees, uh, in about 12 other other states, and so uh, by the way, um, the last poll I think there were three polls done, uh, which did indicate that uh, there's public support. The majority of the public do support uh, public sector uh, employees' uh, collective bargaining rights. Uh, so there's a real controversy going on in this country, and we decided tonight that we would bring a civil dialogue to this question. And we're going to be addressing specifically the question of whether uh, teacher unions are a benefit or an obstacle to uh, the education of our students. Because that's what most of us are concerned about is, you know, how, how does this impact our, our student body? Uh, we've brought people from all perspectives uh, this evening. Uh, we have our panelists include uh, Liv Finn. Did I pronounce that okay? Lee Finn. Oh, Lee Finn. <laughs> Lee Finn. 
uh, who is the Director of Education at the Washington Policy Center, and Mary Lindquist, who is the President of the Washington Education Association, and William Line, who is the President of the United Faculty of Washington State. That's the group that represents the four colleges here in the state that have recently uh, unionized, including uh, Western. And uh, Bill is also on the Board of Directors of the uh, Washington Education Association. So, uh, for our format, what we're going to do is to ask each of the panelists to present their response to that question. Are unions an obstacle or a benefit to the education of students? Uh, and we'll give them about 15 to 20 minutes to present their positions. Uh, and then I will ask each of them, in turn, to respond to some of the points that were made to, to the other uh, uh, speakers. Um, we, we will uh, then have a rather informal conversation. I'd like to let the panelists just have an opportunity to go back and forth if they wish and address different issues uh, with each other without any kind of formal uh, 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 debate. At that point, uh, Dr. Kristen French, the director of, the, of SEED, uh, will start to take your questions and uh, we will have a, a question and answer session uh, bringing up your concerns and, uh, and your thoughts. And then we will end with the Q&A uh, at 7.30 uh, this, this evening. So that's our format. And Liv is, actually has a PowerPoint that she wants to present to you. So we thought what we would do is let her have the stage completely in the beginning so that we don't block the, sit here blocking the screen from, from, for, for you. And uh, so after uh, the PowerPoint presentation, we will all come to the stage and we will join, leave, and we will hear the other presentations and, of course, the, the Q&A. So please join me in welcoming uh, Lee Finn. Well, thank you very much. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, let me tell you first uh, what I do and what the organization that I come from, what it does. I work for a think tank that is called the Washington Policy Center. We have an offices in Seattle, Olympia, the Tri-Cities, and Spokane. And what we do is we have the wonderful opportunity to analyze policy in different areas and to think about them and look at what's happening in other states and to look for the best uh, results that work the best for people in our nation. And we come at it from a free market perspective because we think that limited government and the credit, the freeing up the great creativity and, and uh, potential of individuals in, in our society is the best way to organize our, our lives. So I'm in charge of education, but we have other analysts who cover transportation, small business, uh, the environment, uh, tax and government policy. Uh, now, uh, we only recently opened our, our education center and in uh, 2008 we wrote an education reform plan for Washington State. And I would like to just say that uh, that we think that the greatest obstacle to improving our schools is the huge regulatory component represented by this uh, common schools manual, the schools are the burden that is placed on every school and teacher and principal in this state. And we think this is the greatest obstacle to reform and that to removing some of these limitations and that smother uh, great teachers and great principals is, it should be the first uh, order of business. But the issue tonight is whether unions are an obstacle to change. And uh, I stand for the proposition that they, in my experience, they are an obstacle to change and they need to be persuaded to get on board so that we can get ready for the 21st century and get our students ready for the challenges they face. So I'm going to go quickly through this. I'm going to do what um, policy analysts do, and that is they present the inputs and the outputs, and I have to figure out how to move this here. I think if you move, here we go. Uh, this is what analysts do. 
They first, they define the, the, um, the parameters. We have um, a school population of a million students in Washington. About 100,000 uh, of our students are, are educated in private schools. A million are educated in public schools. We spend $10 billion uh, a year from all state, local, and federal resources. Uh, the spending that reaches the classroom, however, is less than 59 cents of every dollar because there are so many bureaucracies that skim off money before it ever gets to the classroom. Uh, we have 295 school districts, uh, over 2,000 schools. We have zero charter schools in this state. We are one of 10 states that ban, uh, the, uh, ban charter schools from our borders. Um, and 40 states in our nation allow charter schools. The amount of money that we spend uh, per student is $10,200, which has doubled in real terms and real inflation adjusted dollars since 1980. Our pupil-teacher ratio is 19.1. The number of teachers we have are 48,299 elementary and secondary classroom teachers, or 49% of the 101,000 employees in the public schools. Uh, these are the student outcomes. I just defined for you the, student, the inputs. Here are the outcomes. Our 10th grade uh, state test shows that 79% of our uh, students are proficient in reading, 86% are proficient in writing, 41% are proficient in math, 44% are proficient in science. Eighth grade. On the 8th grade NAEP test, you may have heard of that, that is a federal test, the National Assessment of Student Progress. Washington students score slightly above the national average with only 39% proficient or better in math, and only 36% pro proficient or better in reading. So you see that there's a disparity between the uh, outcomes in, uh, on these two different tests, which tells you something about the challenges we have in front of us. What is the standard? What are we expecting of our students? It's not really clear. Uh, the student achievement gap is serious in this state. 84% of white students pass the reading test. Only 66% of black students pass the reading. 63% of black 10th grade students pass the reading. Uh, of of, uh, tenth, of uh, white students, only 47% pass the math test in the 10th grade, but only 19% of ma black students pass the math test, and only 20% of Hispanic students pass the math test in 10th grade. So there's a serious achievement gap, gap and it's growing. Uh, here are some quick um, graphs that you know, visually show you what the trends are. Essentially, we've had some growth in reading and writing uh, over, uh, between 2002 and 2004, but now results are pretty flat. Here, this is the NAEP test score, same sort of flat results. Here we have high school graduation rates. I didn't finish the graph out to 2009, but the number is not different. It's, uh, essentially, we have a third of our students that are dropping out of school, not graduating on time. Uh, Washington State ranks 43rd in the nation in college graduation rates because we have so many dropping out from high school and once they get to college, well, I'll show you the statistics. Two state government reports, Washington learns the Governor uh, Gregoire commissioned and a report from the Higher Education Coordinating Board state that public education officials are producing a generation of students less educated than their parents. And in just a single generation, America has fallen from second place to 11th place in the proportion of students completing college. Or one third drop out of high school. 52% of graduates who enter two year community colleges or technical schools have to enroll in remedial math, English, or reading. 37% of students entering two or four year colleges have to enroll in remedial math or English. Only 53% graduate from college because if you're taking a remedial course, of course that's on you and uh, costs you. And a lot of people that have to take remedial courses drop out. We spend $17.2 million a year in remediation in community and technical colleges. This graph is very interesting, and it tells you what we're up against, and that's why I put it here. We used, to, we used to lead the world in educating our populace, and now what's happened is the world has caught on, and they've decided we've got to do better with our students. And in the last generation, you'll see that the brown lines there show the older generation that has achieved an associate degree or higher in Canada, Japan, Korea, Ireland, Spain, and France, and the US. See the brown lines? The blue lines are the younger cohort the, of, of, of people aged 25 to 34 with an associate degree or higher. So you can see in Canada, Japan, Korea, Ireland, Spain, and France, their younger population is much better educated than their older population. And here in Washington State, our older population is better educated than our younger population. This is a... Um, 
this is an, a, this is an important uh, development that uh, we, have, we have in Washington State uh, been directed by the legislature to create a, um, an accountability matrix for Washington schools. The State Board of Education has created that. They hired a st statistician and they, they addressed a lot of the objections from educators around uh, uh, evaluating uh, schools based on just two test scores in reading and math on the Wassel. So they created a much more comprehensive matrix that, that gives schools a score of one to seven uh, based on uh, their, the scores of their students in reading, math, writing, and science. And then also gave score, scores to, to schools that, that get outsized improvement over time and also give score, uh, imp uh, scores to schools that um, outperform um, their peers with like um, uh, demographics of students so that you can compare a student with the same a school with the same challenges and isolate the effect of the school um, outside of what the uh, challenges are that the student faces. And then there's, so anyway, it's a very complex matrix. They give each school in the state a score of one to seven and then rank them in these five categories. Exemplary, very good, good, fair, and struggling. And you can see from this graph that less than 10% of all students in Washington State are attending schools in the exemplary or very, or very good category. And fully 59.4% of students are attending schools that are ranked in fair or struggling. So this is the challenge. And this is, this is actually a very, um, this is the first step that other states have made uh, towards introducing real education reform is by giving their, every school in the state a grade, and that has made everyone look at themselves and say, what can we do to improve that? And, the, and so we on our, our um, website have the Public School Accountability Index posted, and you can go and look and get the scores for every school in our state, and um, you can search uh, um, below, you can search on that page for the actual <coughs> database that the State Board of Education uh, uh, used to derive these scores. So this, this I know that this this is slightly controversial because people don't want to be criticized. But shoot, we have to we have to take it like men and women, and we have to look at what we're doing so we can improve our the outcomes for for children. So um, let me go on to the next slide. Um, now I'm going to quickly go through education reform in this state so that you can get a context for what we're talking about. In 1993, we passed the um, the Education Reform Act that created state standards for what students should know and do in six subjects, created the WASL to evaluate that knowledge, and supposedly to create the school accountability, giving a school a grade for performance. And, and that has taken until this, you know, about until three years ago. Uh, that's, so that's taken a long time, that third part. Um, and then um, I, in the back of, of this education reform plan, one afternoon, I sat and I, I collected, um, I looked through all of the education uh, reforms that w have been passed by the state of Washington since 1993 in Appendix 5 at the back. I listed all the education reform plans passed by uh, our legislature to try to improve schools and listed them all. Five billion dollars worth of efforts and, and we haven't gotten much for them. And I, I, I call that the Band-Aid approach, pass this 21st Century Schools Act, let's do this, let's do that. It doesn't work. You need to do systemic change. Okay, so uh, two years ago, we passed House Bill 2261, which defines, um, provides a new definition of basic education, would provide a new funding model based on prototype schools, which even more closely defines staffing ratios for administrators, secretaries, teachers, librarians, counselors, and the classified staff. Right now, we fund our schools based on staffing ratios of so many uh, certificated workers to so many students and so many classified workers to so many students, so many administrators to so many students, and now we're going to more carefully define that. Uh, this, it, the goal of this is to reduce class sizes to cla uh, size classes of 17 students in K-4 through four and 25 students in higher grades, and there are working groups that have been created to study changes to school finance, teacher certification, teacher, certification, teacher compensation, and student data collection. Um, this, this reform is a um, pr 
promised to spend three to four billion dollars in addition to the eight billion dollars per year that the state already provides to education. And many are saying that we can't afford it, that redu and that reducing class size is not the best use of existing dollars. That the that the most important thing to do to raise student achievement is to Im improve the effectiveness of our teachers because. Uh, dollar for dollar, you get a lot more student learning if you have a highly effective teacher than if you reduce class sizes. So uh, the last reform uh, last year was Race to the Top. You heard about that. That came from the federal government, U.S. Department of Education reforms. Race to the Top offered $4.3 billion in co competitive grants to states which allow charters and innovation schools to promote innovation in schools, which create data systems to track student learning, revamp teacher pay, and evaluation to reward outstanding teachers and principals who raise student achievement and turn around the lowest performing schools. Uh, last year, the legislature passed uh, Senate Bill 6696, the governor's race to the top. The teachers union wrote that bill, and the education reformers seeking to strengthen the bill were ignored. The bill did not allow for charter schools, innovation schools, allow teacher pay to be changed to reward outstanding teachers and other uh, reforms sought by the race to the top by the Department of Education. Washington's application for funding uh, did not meet the criteria because of the limitations in that bill. And then uh, when it was evaluated by the Department of Education, compared Washington's application to the RTT, you know, race to the top criteria, and it was re and, and rejected it. Oh, gosh. Can you believe that? <laughs> I apologize. It'll go away. Anyway. Uh, the, and uh, our application was rejected by the state, uh, U.S. Department of Education. We ranked 32 out of 36 applicants. Okay, this legislative session, um, these are the reforms that have been opposed by the State Teachers Union. House Bill 1546 and Senate Bill 5792, proposals to allow innovation schools and zones, uh, has been opposed. I, I didn't... I should have said that I go down to Olympia often and I'm asked to testify, so I see this with my own eyes. I'm not just reading this. I see it. Uh, there was another bill proposed by House Bill 1609. That was proposed by a Democrat, Eric Pettigrew, a black legislator from South Seattle. He sought to end the seniority as the basis for t deciding teacher layoff systems that we have now in uh, collective bargaining agreements and allow administrators to consider teacher performance in the decision of making layoffs if they're required. Uh, now uh, young, the youngest teachers will be laid off first even if they are the best teachers in their schools and there's a real effort in our legislature to um, change that because what happened was that House Bill 1609 was defeated in the House but then it was picked up as part of and because because um, of the strong power of the teachers union it, they couldn't get out of the normal committee process because the the chairs of the committees, the education committees, refused to let it let this bill proceed. So, in order to get around that, um, reformers, Democrats, and a bipartisan group of Democrats and reformers attached an amendment to uh, Senate Bill 1443, which is right now being considered, and they're trying to end seniority-based uh, layoffs and required uh, performance to be considered. Uh, another, that's happening right now. Um, and then there's another bill, um, House Bill 1593, which would, allow, which would have allowed alternate certification route for principals to encourage individuals with leadership qualities to lead our schools. That was opposed by the union. So these are reforms that are not even mentioned in Olympia because of teacher union power. Charter schools can't even talk about it. Uh, repealing the mandatory deduction of teacher dues, RCW 4159100, through this provision, uh, teachers have $900 a year deducted from their paychecks, regardless of whether they want it or not. And this allows the teachers union to, to create a war chest of $70 million a year. And then there's another provision which no one talks about, but I wish they would talk about, and that is RCW 28A 405-100, which makes it unreasonably difficult to remove underperforming teachers because they're not only bad for students, but they're, an un, they're a burden on the good teachers that are out there because the good teachers have to do the work of two teachers when they have a, a class that has been taught by a poor teacher before them. So uh, that is basically, those are basically my points for the position that the teachers union is an obstacle to change. 
Uh, these are other approaches to education reform, are eight ways to reverse the decline of public education. There's a book that we published with a, a Microsoft millionaire, Scott Oakey, who's done great things for students. He wrote this book called Outrageous Learning. He has a website, outrageouslearning.com, and he's trying to create a parents' union where parents could pay $12 a year to join the union and then perhaps meet the power of the teachers' union head on. And then there's another book that I really recommend, and that is by Dr. William Ochi, who is a professor of management at UCLA uh, Anderson School of Management. He wrote, he has done extensive, he is an expert in organizational design, and he has pointed out that um, uh, businesses have, um, have reorganized the way they, large businesses have learned that in order to get excellence in in every unit, in every local unit of every local Starbucks and every local Honda dealer. You have to decentralize control and put the local managers in control of their, of their assets and their people. And that's how you get excellence in every local unit. But that the schools have not done that. And what we have is that we, the schools have not changed and have not learned that lesson. And so he says, so he, so he points this out and then he visited 600 schools in, over a period of seven years and in this book, he shows what principals who are allowed the freedom to control their budgets and their uh, schedules and their program, what they're able to do for students. And what they do is they reduce the total student loads on teachers. And that is the only reform that has shown dramatic increases in student learning. So this is a book I really recommend. And I wish the teachers' unions would listen, would read this book because this is something that would really help teachers and really improve learning for students. I can't get them to listen to me. And so here we, but there are 15 large school districts and more soon that are in the nation that are allowing schools the power to make budgetary, personnel, and instructional decisions. They permit families to decide which public school their children will attend. They shift power from central office staffs to families, principals, and teachers. And the results show, so far show that students are doing better, parents and teachers are more satisfied. Everything is better in these decentralized districts. And here's a list of the districts, Baltimore Public Schools at the head. I, I had the CEO of Baltimore Public Schools, Dr. Andre Alonso, come and speak in January. And I have, a, I have his presentation on my, on, my, on my website. And this man has done a, a miracle for the children of Baltimore by decentralizing, by taking money, slashing $145 million in spending from the central district, moving $88 million to the control of the principals, and letting them meet the needs of their individual students. He also got rid of uh, student suspensions and expulsions. It's, it's very, he's a very interesting man. And here are his results. Reading scores in Baltimore City Schools. See, see those graphs going up in every grade and every subject. Reading and math over time has improved. So that's essentially my point and my argument, and I very much welcome and look forward to talking to you all. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back again. Um, Lee mentioned, by the way, um, a book by... Scott Oakey, mm -hmm. um, Outrageous Learning, I mm -hmm. think was the title of it. We had tried to get uh, um, Scott to join Leaf uh, on this panel, mm -hmm. and uh, we weren't able to. Uh, it's off in Hawaii, and, uh, <laughs> and we couldn't find a replacement. We tried a couple times. So I just wanted to explain to you why we have two people representing the unions and Leaf representing uh, the other position. Uh, and I thank you, by the way, for uh, joining us. Uh, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, we're now going to hear the positions of um, um, Mary Lindquist of the Washington Education Association, who will uh, present uh, another view for you to consider and think about. And then uh, William Line will uh, conclude with his presentation. And then, as I said, uh, we will ask each, three, each of you to respond then to comments made by, by the other. So please uh, welcome uh, Mary Lindquist now. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. It's um, great to be up here, not because, uh, just because I enjoy coming up and uh, visiting Billingham and meeting up with uh, Bill, 
but also because it's really good to get out of Olympia. Uh, I've been down there uh, pretty much nonstop. Um, talk about civility. Um, I welcome a civil discourse after what I've been enduring in Olympia. You know, this is a strange question for me to answer. Uh, you know, are unions an obstacle or benefit to students' education? I mean, would we phrase the question, are teachers an obstacle or benefit to students' education? Because, um, you know, I, I belong to a union. I belong to a union since I first started teaching. Um, but I didn't get into teaching to join the union. I got into teaching because my parents were teachers, and my dad said to me that I had an obligation to leave this world a better place than I found it. That I needed to do something to make a contribution to my community. And my mom and my dad and my older brothers were teachers, so it became a natural. I loved reading. I loved writing. I loved history. So that's what I majored in. You know, I became a teacher to make a difference. And my mother, um, when she died, she was 94. She had stopped teaching when she was 63. So for the 31 years after she retired, to the day she died, she described herself as a teacher. And she was also active in the union. I'm a teacher. That's not what I do for a living. It's simply who I am. And I represent 82,000 other educators around the state who share a very similar passion to mine. Um, so to ask me if the union's an obstacle is like asking me, is a teacher the obstacle? And I think that's just absurd. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm here tonight, down in Olympia yesterday, a um, few years ago when I was bargaining local contracts for my union, I was there, I was grounded as a high school social studies and English teacher, and that never leaves you. But uh, more specifically to get to the question, um, because I also was a debate coach, and I know that uh, it's important to answer the question you're posed. You know, I think the question is perhaps most scientifically answered by research done uh, at Harvard University. The Harvard Educational Review uh, published a report a few weeks ago where they studied the uh, unions, did a statistical analysis of the states where unions are strong, and then looked at student SAT and ACT scores. And they found that states with strong union presence, strong teacher union presence, actually had higher scores. And um, what their research discovered was that in states with strong collective bargaining rights, teachers had more preparation time, more time for collaboration. They had limits on the number of students uh, that should be in the classroom. They had uh, orchestrated, um, defined professional development that often the teachers got to uh, design for themselves. They placed qualifications on who got to teach what classes. And all of that boiled down in the words of the Harvard Educational Review that taken together, these possible benefits of unions may enhance not only the status of teachers, but also the education climate to which students are exposed. States with strong unions tend to spend more on education. And I have to add a small, or perhaps large, caveat that this is really just about the first study on the correlation between unions and student achievement. And to extrapolate too much from this one study uh, would be inappropriate. But I think it is a good foundation. It certainly does um, reinforce my biases. And so uh, I'm inclined to, uh, to pay some attention to it. And I would encourage you to, to, to also do that. And if you're really interested in this topic, uh, there is another, uh, as long as we're handing out suggested reading, uh, there is a um, guy I have tremendous respect for. 
former uh, school superintendent uh, in the Bellevue School District, uh, a man who has worked with John Gardner uh, closely and been an advisor to him on some of his projects. His name is Dick Clark, and he has a blog called communityandeducation.org. And he just finished a six-part series on the impact of unions um, on uh, quality education. He said some things in that um, blog that, I, that certainly resonated with me. Uh, he said, first of all, um, educating students is a team sport. That it takes a collective uh, effort by both administrators, uh, teachers, educational support professionals, parents, and the community. And that if you are going to have any kind of meaningful uh, reform or change, you simply have to include all of those parties. Uh, no one party can do it by themselves, and certainly uh, we can't legislate reform from Washington, D.C. or Olympia. Uh, it has to be embraced uh, by the people who actually are in the classrooms and bringing the kids to school every day. Um, he talked about, um, I think, some of the, the uh, points that Leah has pointed out. That, and we do face some problems in public education. Um, we need to address the achievement gap. Uh, we need to figure out why uh, our white middle class and upper middle class students continue to perform among the best in the world. Uh, the, the education we provide to our students in suburban communities is just uh, outstanding. And that we have not been able to replicate that into communities of poverty is something we have to address. Now personally, I think when a student comes into my classroom hungry, um, living in a car uh, without a, a home uh, situation where English is even spoken. They face some challenges that as a high school English and social studies teacher, I just may not be up to dealing with. I can identify it, I can empathize, but I don't have the skills to rec or the tools to rectify those problems. And so if we really are concerned about student achievement, it has to happen not only in the classroom, but making sure that when our students walk into the classroom, they come prepared and ready to learn. And that cannot just be the responsibility of the teachers or the teachers' union. Uh, it has to be a shared responsibility with parents and community. And I don't say that as an excuse for not addressing this problem, but simply as a reality. We are not going to close the achievement gap in this country as long as we continue to allow uh, racism and classism to hold some of our students down. It just isn't going to happen. And so those are some fundamental changes we have to make. Where we see schools, um, West Seattle Elementary, in, uh, or Hawthorne Elementary in Seattle, uh, West Seattle Elementary, where they have provided wraparound services these are two of our lowest performing schools in the state, and they have provided wraparound services for the kids who are in those schools. That means that there is medical staff available to those kids uh, at school. There is legal support for their parents if they're dealing with immigration issues. Uh, they have all these services for the kids. They send the kids home every Friday with a bag of food. When you do those things, we're beginning to see some amazing turnaround in some of these poor schools. And that's the approach that I think we need to make. I'm very proud of the work that the Washington Education Association does in our 19 uh, schools identified in this state as being low performing. Um, we're working very hard in those schools to bring in resources, both from the national uh, organization, from NEA, and also from WA, working with both administrators and the teachers in those buildings uh, to bring about the kind of change that those kids in our neediest communities deserve. So um, I guess I have an alternative view uh, to what you've seen. There are problems we need to deal with, but the only way we're going to deal with those problems successfully is uh, by working together. And <laughs> after being in Olympia, I have to say, and by funding our schools better than we do. We currently have the largest class sizes in the nation with the exception of two dismal states, Utah and California. We have the largest class sizes in the nation. 
where you go to Massachusetts or Maryland and a kindergarten student's in a classroom of 15 or 16 kids, our kindergarten classrooms in too many places in the state, 28, 29, 30 students. That is just morally wrong. And we simply have to address that issue. For us to expect to have world caliber schools when we are funding them the worst in the nation is simply ridiculous. And so we have to address that issue, and, um, and that's something else that I think the association is very good at, at being an advocate uh, for our members, but also being an advocate for the students in our classroom and uh, working towards better funding of our schools. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So please welcome now uh, William Lyon. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to put in a plug for both Kristen and Lorraine. Um, the Center and the Journal for Educational Controversy are both really great things that, that you should all, I think, pay attention to and, and be engaged with. And thanks. I mean, this is the 13th annual one of these forums. I did another one a couple of years ago, and this is really great work by these two professors from Woodring. So I want to thank them first. Um, now, my obviously, Leave and, and Mary are, are much more experts in K-12 through education than I am. I'm the, the president of the faculty union, the United Faculty of Washington State, and we represent the faculty at, at Western, Eastern, Central, and Evergreen in this state. Um, so I want to talk in a little larger sense, um, not so much about the nitty-gritty of K-12 through education, um, but about unions and education generally. Um, I, want, I want to begin, though, responding to a couple of things that, that Lee said, a couple of things that I do actually know something about. One of the, the slides that she put up there said that we were 43rd in the country in college graduation rates, and I know exactly why that is, um, because we are desperately underfunded at our universities. This state ranks 48th in the country in what we call college participation rates. That is the, the, the percentage of people between 19 and 63 who attend our college, our four-year colleges. We're 48th in the country, okay? Um, we are third in the country, in the top five in the percentage of our population who has BA degrees or better. That combination makes us um, third in the country in the percentage of people with BA degrees are better that we import. That is a direct result of a chronic and historic underfunding of our state universities. And it is because business in this country, in this state, when they go to Olympia and they're behind closed doors with, with legislators, what they say is, and, and, and the other, the other um, startling statistic about this is that we are fifth in the nation in the funding of community and technical colleges. Um, we're second in the nation, we might even be first now after the last round, um, in the nation in the percentage of our higher education budget that goes to community and technical colleges. Um, and, and it's easy to see why that dynamic plays out. If I am Boeing or Microsoft, if I'm a big company in this state, when I'm behind closed doors with legislators, what I can say is, look, don't you dare tax me to pay for those state universities because when I go to recruit those kinds of employees, when I go to look for people um, to, to occupy the corner offices in my building, I can recruit all over the country, if not all over the world. What I, when I go to recruit people who are going to fix my air conditioners or come in to fix my computers, I'm recruiting at the end of the bus line. So I do want you to pay for the, the I need a more local workforce from the community and technical colleges, but the workforce that I get from universities, I can get all over the world. Um, the big losers in that deal are, of course, people living in the middle of the middle class and below in Washington State who don't have the same kind of access to state universities that people in other states do. In some sense, those people pay the price for this being such a desirable state to move to. I mean, that's, that's why our universities have been chronically underfunded, why our faculty have been chronically underpaid, why, why this state has been able to get away with creating some very fine universities at wildly below market rates, because this is a desirable place to move. Um, the other thing I want to, uh, that I, I feel like I do some, know something about is a little bit of the achievement graph, gap, and I just want to echo what, what Mary was saying. 
the idea that we're going to blame teachers or blame schools for um, the achievement gaps between white people and everybody else in this society is ridiculous. I mean, the, we live in a country that was born um, on racist and classist principles, that remains absolutely committed to those racist and cla classist principles, and the idea that teachers are going to overcome you know, many centuries of Western racism and, and, and that will then be a re reflected in, in, the, in closing these achievement gaps it seems to me to be focusing on some really micro part of the problem and not, not a large, the larger, really systemic and historical problems that we need to deal with there. Um, so in, in, in talking about unions um, and whether they're useful for education or whether they work for, for education, I want to, I leaves um, the Washington Policy Center, that's the name of it, it the, I went to their website and, and I think that was genuinely clarifying for me because it really does, I think, lay out what is the stark difference between uh, the two positions. Um, the, the logo on, on the Washington Policy Center says, Improving Lives Through Market Solutions. And that, that, that is the genuinely clarifying thing, because the drive in the so-called education reform movement is to turn education into a market and to privatize education. And so the question really is, are we going to get better education through publicly funded education, through a commitment to a public sphere, to a commitment to, to genuinely publicly supporting education, or are we going to get it by privatizing education? Because there's a, a, a very wide network of very well-funded institutes, think tanks, policy centers that um, have, been, have been at work for a long time, you know, for at least the last 30 years, um, that are designed to, to, to do exactly the, the stated goal of the Washington Policy Center, which is to shrink the public sector um, and to, to um, turn things like education. And education is the last great market that's a, or the next great market that's available for private corporations. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a capitalist arrangement, capitalism always needs an ever-expanding market to have, a, uh, to have some sort of access to. Um, education is a huge one, and this is why you see huge amounts of money being invested by private foundations, the Gates Foundation, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the, the Packard Foundation, um, lots of money invested in education reform from these foundations that were created by private corporations. Um, you see the need for um, new educational markets even infecting uh, trade agreements. The, WEO, the WTO is currently trying to negotiate trade agreements that would allow um, for a reduction in, in barriers to trade between countries. And one of the things that that would do, one of the things that is already done in Jamaica is when American for-profit education institutions come to foreign countries who have signed some of these treaties, um, the treaty says there will be no internal regulations that, that uh, create barriers to trade. And so when the Kaplans, when the Phoenixes and places like that show up in, in other countries, and those countries want to bring their local educational quality control to bear on the kinds of education that, that those companies are bringing to those countries, they're then told, no, you can't do that because that would be a violation of the trade agreement. So the idea of education as a marketplace, as a, as a for-profit thing, um, is I think really what we're talking about here. Are our kids going to get better educations through a, a market private model or through a public sector model? Um, the, the assaults on unions generally, on public sector unions, I mean, that we're really seeing the fruit of right now in places like Wisconsin and Indiana and Illinois and, and Florida, and we're one bad election here away from the same kinds of assaults on public sector. Well, and, and the, the same kinds of assaults are really being brought in a kinder, gentler way in this state um, uh, on, on public sector unions. The demonization of public sector unions, this is, I think, also um, the, the tip of a 30 to 40 year iceberg. I mean, we have seen a general assault 
on the public sphere and the middle class um, in this country for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, the gap between people who have things and people who don't has been dramatically um, um, exacerbated. Um, and the resources available for the public sphere have been radically diminishing. I mean, when the, when the, House, uh, the, 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 the House of Representatives in Washington State proposed their budget, the most interesting slide that they did at their press conference when they proposed their budget was the slide that showed that per thousand dollars of income in this state, we now tax you know, that income at levels that are the lowest since 1986. Um, that, that what the, the, the combination of these market kinds of principles and the, 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 the interlocking um, groups of politicians, think tanks, institutes that have been pushing these kinds of principles for the last 30 years has led to a, a huge diminishment in, in investment in the public sphere. Um, I think one of the things that you would have to say um, about what's happening to public education generally. One of the, to, to talk about what, regardless of, of whether or not we might agree on, on how well public education is doing or whether it's failing or not, if we're going to, to have some sort of provisional agreement that we need to do better, one of the first things I think we need to look at is the investment of resources. And the investment of resources in public education has been going steadily downward. Um, and it has especially been going steadily downward in this state. We are now in the low 40s in pu per pupil pun funding um, for public education in this state. Um, it, 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 it becomes, I mean, I, was, I attended a, a, a Chamber of Commerce uh, conference where the general counsel from Microsoft, a guy named Brad Smith, um, gave a talk. And, it, and I think it, it's, it's indicative of how interested private corporations have become in uh, the market of education that Brad Smith, who's the general counsel for Microsoft, makes $100 million a year, has 1,000 lawyers working for him, is, 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 is addressing the Greater Seattle Chamber of Commerce, and of a 30-minute speech, 20 minutes of it was focused on education. Okay? Um, the, the, he, he talked about a lot of the same kinds of things that Leaf did, um, when he was asked afterward if he had any idea what the per-pupil funding for K-12 education in this state was, he claimed he had no idea. Okay. Um, if, if I had been able to talk to him, the question I, wanted, uh, the, the, the question I would have posed to him was to be to say, look, if, this, if you perceived a problem at Microsoft of the same kind of magnitude that you, you're saying the problem is in public education, what you would do is go out and find the best people you could pay them a lot of money, get out of their way, okay, not, not burden them with a lot of regulation or tests or stuff like that, and then fire them if they didn't get the job done. The only thing that education reform in the public sector wants to do out of those things is the last one, is fire teachers. I mean, all of these bills that, we, we, that we're talking about in terms of, of the, the, the teachers union opposes in, in Olympia and things like that are about firing teachers, okay? Um, the uh, and, 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 and I guess I would, I would also echo what Mary says, and this has been some of our experience um, with the faculty union too. I mean, that, that quite often we'll have administrators or ed reformers or, or, or um, uh, politicians say to me, well, the difference between the faculty and the union. And I say, well, no, we are the union. I mean, they, 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 everybody loves teachers. Nobody likes teachers when they gather in groups of three or more is sort of the, the way that this works. And there's this, this constant sort of, of, of campaign to somehow separate teachers from the union. Well, teachers are the union. Faculty are the union. Um, you know, I'm a faculty member here. I'm the president of the statewide union. I'm also a college professor. Um, and I guess in, in terms of, of that kind of stuff, I would argue that organized people always make things better. Um, certainly, um, the history of organized labor in this country is, has, its, has its ups and downs, but it, it's, it's impossible, I think, to argue that organized labor has not made things better in this country. When firefighters are organized in this state, what they do, the, given that they're the ones who come to your house and put out fires, 
what they're, uh, what they're engaged with at the bargaining table is how to make their jobs safer and how to, make them, how to get the resources they need to do their jobs of putting out the fires in your house better. Okay? When teachers come to the bargaining table in this state, what they're engaged with, I mean, nobody goes into teaching to get rich. Okay? Everybody knows that if you, you go to school and you become, and, and look, you've got to do a lot of school to become a teacher. People with that kind of access to that kind of school had other choices. Had other choices where, where any rational person can look at those choices and know, I could make a lot more money doing this instead of that. If I'd have gone to law school like my mama wanted me to, I could be buying and selling people here. Okay? Um, the, the choices that those people make to go into that kind of profession, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's a clear choice, and it's a clear choice that isn't just about maximizing their individual salaries, their individual profits. When teachers come to the bargaining table, and I know that when professors come to the bargaining table, because I was there, um, we're genuinely interested in the learning conditions for our students, okay? Our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. From the other side of the table, and this is with no disrespect or animosity to the people who sit on the other side of the table, but structurally, the job of those people, okay, is to do things as cheaply as possible, okay? To continue to produce the product of the student with as little cost as possible. Um, and they are generally rewarded with that, with much greater salaries than the teachers and um, the the uh, the professors have. I mean, most of the problems that, that Leave identified, I, I had a hard time finding a causal relationship between what she identified as, as the problems with our schools and teachers. Um, I mean, most of those problems seem to me to be management problems. Um, and that seems to me a, 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 a fundamental principle that we need to keep in mind. When labor comes to the table, when teachers come to the table, when professors come to the table, Given the choices we've made, given the jobs that we have, um, and given the commitments that we bring to our students, um, a big part of what we're doing is creating conditions that will be better for our students. The job of management, the job of bosses, and the job of, of all of the people who inform them is to produce this as cheaply as possible. And that's, that's the conflict. And I would argue that if, if you were to take away uh, the collective bargaining rights of the people who teach our children, or the people who teach our students in, in universities, that, that you would dramatically diminish um, the education that our students would receive. And I, I, think that, I think that's borne out in most of the for-profit institutions that you see, um, that you see operating in, in the education market now. Um, so for me, the question is, should school be a for-profit enterprise? And my answer would be no. And um, I think that, that public sector unions and teachers unions are the, one of the last great bulwarks against um, the destruction of the public sphere in this country and the destruction of the middle class. Um, it, it is certainly um, a very, very difficult battle that we're fighting right now. Um, and it certainly is one that, that we're more or less on the losing side of right now. Um, what I would, I would encourage you to understand is that this battle has been going on not for the last two or three years, but at least since the mid-1970s um, in this country and especially in this state. And the continuing demonization of public sector employees, the, I mean, the, 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 the way in which everybody from the governor of Wisconsin to, to some degree to the politicians in this state, to the Seattle Times doesn't miss a day almost, of, of demonizing public employees and public uh, workers. The way in which the, the sleight of hand that allows people walking around to believe that somehow the economic problems that we face right now are the fault of teachers or firefighters or police officers. I mean, I wish, I wish there were commercials on TV right now with, with a fourth grade teacher looking into the camera and saying, um, you know, while, while Wall Street bankers were taking away your pension and your job and your house, I was teaching your child to read. I mean, I wish there were a firefighter looking into the camera saying, while your life was being destroyed by the greed of the for-profit sector, I was putting out fires. Um, and 
the idea that somehow organized labor in the public sector is holding back excellence, and especially excellence in the education of our students, seems to me ludicrous. Thank you. Okay, we will then go in turn again, uh, leave, and then um, leave, leave, and then Mary, and then Bill again. So, okay. Let me just make clarify some misstatements of fact. In Washington State, we spend $10,200 per student, and that is the most we have ever spent in our history. We are ranked 33rd in the state, in the nation, on per pupil spending. We are not at the bottom by a long shot. We have increased spending in public education every year loyally and truthfully. This year, the state is going to spend another half a million dollars more than they spent last year. This is a big lie. We spend more money. We care about education. The public sector puts more and more and more money into education every year. Now, let's, we're here at the Center for Social Justice and Equity. We're talking about excellence and providing a chance through education for poor and minority people to make a way for themselves and become middle class and upper middle class people. And the way out of poverty, as you all know, is through education. And we haven't gotten an end. And I invite you to go to our website and look at the study that I just wrote on charter schools. Charter, the best quality charter schools in our nation are doing just that. They're called KIPP. Have you heard of Knowledge is Power program? Of course you've heard of that. Green Dot Schools, uh, uh, rocket ship charters in San Jose. They are taking poor minority Hispanic children and bringing them out of the lowest scoring uh, school in the state. And that's because... Those schools had been given the freedom to operate out from all the restrictions that are in the regulations and out from under the restrictions that are imposed upon them by collective bargaining agreements. Collective bargaining agreements don't permit the principal to decide who teaches at his school. Collective bargaining agreements don't allow the principal to give performance pay for the great teachers. Collective bargaining agreements force principals to take the lowest lemon teachers in the district, whether they want them or not. Ironically, uh, Mary mentioned West Seattle Elementary. That is a, a very, has been a very poor performing school, and that got a special memorandum of understanding with the union to operate free from the collective bargaining agreements. So there, they have Teach for America teachers, they have teachers that are getting paid performance pay, and those teachers are going to be free from seniority-based layoffs, so they won't be laid off in the coming layoffs. So there, the youngest teachers in that school will not be laid off first, as the collective bargaining agreements will require for the entire rest of the district. So I'll stop with that. I, I, I'll make one observation that I cannot believe the fear and paranoia and class warfare uh, rhetoric that is being thrown up. <laughs> business needs good schools and business would pay teachers more. But you know, it's not in the interest of the union to pay teachers more. Te unions want to have more teachers to pay dues. That is in direct conflict with what teachers should be getting. We could have been paying teachers double what we paid if we didn't put so much money into reducing class sizes. Think about that. It is the obviously teachers are the best, most noble, most wonderful, self-denying, wonderful people on this earth. They are very different than their union leadership. That we we need some we need some specific answers from these leaders. Why do we not permit charter schools? Why can't we have KIPP schools in this state? Why can't we have green dot schools in this state? Why can't our poor and minority children get a chance to, to escape from their neighborhood failing, struggling schools? We have 74,000 children in Washington State stuck in those schools. Now, I'll stop with that. Mary? Um, green dot charter schools are unionized. Not all, some of them are. So, uh, <laughs> they're charters. Uh, we have over 574 innovative schools in the state. Some of you may have graduated from some of those schools. 
Um, they come in all stripes and sizes. Um, some of them are designed around thematic programs, uh, math science, like the uh, SAMI, a STEM school in Tacoma, Aviation High School, um, um, uh, Air Technologies, Math Science Technology Program in Seattle, Delta School in the Tri-Cities. There's a number of programs like that. There are also a number of programs um, that uh, focus on the arts. Um, I know here in Bellingham there's a, an amazing elementary school that focuses in on uh, International Baccalaureate for Elementary Kids. Um, you know, we have a whole variety of uh, innovative programs. There's room within our existing structures for those kinds of programs. And, you know, I, I don't think any of us would want to see them diminished. But what I have been told by um, people who would like to increase the number of innovative schools that we have in our state is we don't have the money to do it. They're more expensive. Uh, than to run a traditional elementary or middle school or high school. And uh, with the, the funding situation the way it is, the steady decline of funding over the years, um, that you know, continues to be a problem. Now, as far as collective bargaining, the changes uh, that have been made in Seattle um, in their most recent bargain uh, and the uh, waivers that were given to West Seattle Elementary School and Hawthorne Elementary School and uh, Cleveland High School and a number of other schools were negotiated changes. Uh, they were cases of where the association, uh, the district came together and said uh, there are procedures that make sense in a lot of our buildings, but for some very special reasons, uh, they don't make sense in others. For instance, when Tacoma was starting up their SAMI program, a math science program, they uh, recruited and asked teachers who were interested in teaching this environment to apply and attracted a, a disproportionate number of young teachers because of the way the program was designed. It was just more attractive to some young teachers. So they then bargained provision in Tacoma where those teachers would be exempt uh, from any layoff. And this was done three or four years ago before we saw layoffs on the horizon. If you look at the uh, Hawthorne Elementary and West Seattle Elementary in Seattle, they decided the most important thing for those students to do well in those two struggling schools was to have an ongoing, consistent relationship with the teachers in their building. And that's why they bargained in that to, and in those two schools that those teachers who chose to go to that school would be exempt. Uh, from any necessary layoff. Lee has mentioned one of the uh, misguided pieces of education reform that we see in Olympia right now, and that is uh, the uh, uh, 1443. Let me tell you what that bill would do. If you're in a district where you have a math teacher who is underperforming, and that, that math teacher is on probation, but the demographics in your, bill, your district have changed, and you have too many elementary teachers, and the elementary school enrollment has dropped. This bill would require that you lay off that math teacher rather than the elementary teacher where you might have the, the unnecessary number of teachers. I mean, it's ridiculous to come, try to come up with a system from Olympia that, that ties the hands of districts to determine what works. It would also mean that what Seattle has bargained would be thrown out. What Tacoma has bargained would be thrown out. What Snohomish has bargained would be thrown out. And they all have to do their, their do it the way the state says to do it. I just don't see how that makes sense. Um, we have, as I said, we have things that we need to change in our schools. Getting rid of the union is not the way to change it. Uh, the way to make the changes is to increase funding and to increase cooperation among parents, among administrators, uh, among the community, and, and the teaching corps. That's, that's what's going to work to make a difference. <coughs> Um, first, I, wa I want to take full credit as the paranoid class warfare guy, and not not hang that on Mary. Um, that um, that um, and uh, I certainly uh, um, in 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 a society where the the concentration of wealth in the top one percent of our society and the 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 gap between um, the the concentration of wealth at the top and um, 
the, the, the overwhelming majority of people in the, in the lower rungs of the society is greater than it's been since 1928 in this country. I mean, that, that seems a moment. It, it always, it always, I always find it interesting that it's people at the top who are always saying it's class warfare when people who are immiserated at the bottom say maybe you shouldn't have 90% of the stuff. Um, that's then described as class, the, the people without things are always described as the ones who are waging class warfare. Um, I, I would suggest that the class warfare has been going on for quite a while, and it's been warfare directed from the top toward the bottom. Um, the, uh, the, the per pupil funding question, I mean, look, the data that I've seen says we're 45th in the country. The data that Liv is, is, is giving us tonight says we're 33rd. 33rd doesn't seem to be something to be terribly proud of. Um, and in any event, it's not enough. The one part of, of Lee's argument that I think would bear much greater scrutiny is the actual amount of money that goes on the screen, the actual amount of money that is devoted to instruction, okay? And how much, how much of the money gets diverted? I mean, if you want to beat on moron administrators, I'm right there with you. I'm the <laughs> union guy, and I am happy to do that. I mean, you know, from, from my perspective, all bosses are overpaid, and there's way too many of them. Um, and the, um, the best way to direct that money back toward instruction is through collective bargaining. Okay? You can make all the rules you want in Olympia because what Olympia does is make all the rules, send the money to the, the administrators who run things, and disappear. At our university, we, uh, once we, we, we were very recently unionized. In, in the years, in the 10 years before we unionized, the percentage of the budget devoted to instruction had gone down by 4%. Since we've unionized, it's gone back up by 2%. Okay? Um, getting the money to instruction is absolutely the, the, um, the priority of teachers and professors, and, and the best way to achieve that is to have very strong collective bargaining from the people who are actually doing the instructing. Um, that, that, again, I'm still confused by this, this description of the gap between the, the saint-like teachers and their evil union bosses. I mean, that I'm a teacher, I'm a professor. Um, everybody I know who works for this, our union, is also a teacher. Um, the, the union leadership is democratically elected by the teachers, not like um, a lot of the ed reform movement who are, you know, Microsoft millionaires who have appointed themselves experts on ref ed re you know, education suddenly. Um, if, if there were that great a gap between um, the sainted teachers and the evil union bosses, they'd get voted out. Um, you know, the, 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 the union is absolutely representing the interests of the people they represent. Um, the other thing that, that I get, and, and look, all of the, the nooks and crannies and ins and outs of charter schools and things like that, I'm obviously not, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my league on that. The idea, though, that we are going to have the benevolence of people from Bellevue, the benevolence of millionaires from Microsoft who are creating think tanks and foundations and charter schools and programs that will allow people from blighted neighborhoods to escape their cultures, their neighborhoods, their families, and, 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 and um, come up to the middle class. Escape seems to me the wrong thing that we need to be providing. I mean, again, those neighborhoods, those communities have been devastated by centuries of class warfare, by centuries of racist stuff in this country. To have a bunch of well-meaning, benevolent white people with money come along and say, I'm here to save you from yourselves, um, strikes me as a wrong-headed way to go about this. We need to invest in those communities. We need to, we need to do systematic and, and much broader than just school reform ways of, of addressing you know, a, a deeply racist society and not just pick a few kids who are going to score well on a test and say, you get to go to a charter school and escape your, your, your place of origin. Um, anybody who wants to join could, in Could now. I say something to that? But so you then join the, uh, this uh, chorus of evil uh, white guys who says to the parents stuck in the inner city school, you will not get a choice of a charter school. You see, the union has joined these awful people that have 
this conspiracy to keep people down, <laughs> which I, I completely reject. <coughs> there is no such conspiracy to keep people in poverty or to uh, diminish their opportunities. The, the, whole, the whole point of charter schools is to allow parents that do not have the choice and the ability to go to a, uh, to put their kid in a, in a rich suburban school, to allow parents who don't have those choices a school that, that will improve the potential for their kid to succeed in education. That's the whole point of this. And the unions are strong opponents to charter <coughs> schools. How is that social justice? That, they're, they're just big fat cats along with the big business, just like the big business. These are big, powerful institutions, these unions, just as determined to protect their interests as every other interest in this society. Just because they're teachers doesn't mean that they're not uh, interested in, in acquiring power over society. Don't just because they they started out as good people, as as uh, educate as as seriously. You're saying that you're the same. I'm a teacher, and I'm a teachers' union leader, and therefore I am a good person. Well, let me let me tell you, there's a bill in in, in Olympia that if if it comes to reductions in uh, the budget uh, it was proposed by a union uh, representative uh, to cut five days out of the year for, for, for students. And that has happened in Los Angeles. They have cut the number of instructional days because the teachers will not roll back their pay increases that they received. So, you know, that's not exactly uh, a, a, a good for students. Now I'm getting tired. It's late in the day. I'm forgetting. I'm I'm starting to babble. But but um, don't don't think that because a union uh, is made up of teachers, they don't behave like every other group of, of people that wants to accrue power to themselves. They represent the interests of adults. They are not representing the interest of students. If they were, they would be allowing charter schools in this state. They would be allowing performance pay for teachers. They would be allowing all sorts of innovations that would make your jobs as future teachers much better and much more rewarding than, they, than it will be. I mean, you should look at the collective bargaining agreements. The collective bargaining agreement for professors sets up a rigorous, uh, a rigorous uh, process for gaining tenure that, is, that is, takes a long time, that is controlled by the professors, that is, uh, whose goal is to get the best possible uh, professors in your classrooms. If you look at the collective bargaining agreement for K-12 teachers, you get, teachers get automatic tenure, automatic. They don't have to prove that they're effective in the classroom. And then the whole bargaining agreement is set up to protect low-performing teachers from being removed from the classroom. And that's essentially what the union has become. It's protected the lowest common denominator of teacher, and it has put huge burdens on the best teachers and has prevented the best teachers from getting performance pay and being rewarded for their hard work. And so the best teachers are the ones who heartily resent these low-performing teachers because they get handed a classroom of students that are a year behind, and they have to bring them up two years' worth of learning instead of one year. So that's what is happening in the schools. And that is, and, and principals are not able to create a, a group of teachers dedicated to the mission of raising the achievement of schools. They're just reduced to building managers. They can't control their budgets. They don't control who teaches there. That's why charter schools are, are achieving such great gains for, for children that come from poor backgrounds. And because they're, the, those, those schools are freed up from all the uh, uh, regulation imposed on them by collective bargaining agreements and by by a common schools manual. So I'm arguing for a free market version of public education. By no means are, am I, are we interested in privatizing education. That is a complete lie. We're trying to improve public education. And the way to improve public education is to look at the private school model. There you have private schools that you don't see you don't see private school teachers screaming and yelling about how badly they're treated and their working conditions are so awful. They're not. Private schools are doing much better jobs at educating 
um, poor and minority children than the public schools are. And that is because they're autonomous and free to do, to meet the needs of the students. So, so that is, you know, I, I find it surprising to get this sort of slanderous reaction from the professor here. You know, when you haven't read clearly what's on there, or you wouldn't say that, because I have on, on our website in our education page. I read the what, market solutions part. Yes, isn't that a terrible <laughs> idea? <laughs> Let's just dismiss everything she says, but she's talking about market solutions. Well, I invite you to my education page about the center, and you'll see the people that I've brought here to speak about education, and you'll see that my interest is very sincere about improving education, public education, and and to and 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 I submit to you all that the uh, union is an obstacle. Why don't we get some questions? Well, from I, the... I have to take on Sean's one thing. Yeah. And I, for, not for a moment do I doubt your sincerity, mm -hmm. and uh, that you are uh, interested in uh, uh, improving education for our students. But you've got to get the facts right. <laughs> and your analysis of tenure may be accurate in uh, the higher ed world. I, I don't know that world very well. But what I do know is a K-12 certificated in police state do not have tenure. And we do not get automatic uh, continuing contracts. Uh, in order for a teacher um, to receive a continuing contract, which is not the same thing as tenure, once you have tenure, as a professor does, uh, you really can't lose your job. Well, you can. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, but but um, yeah. So, but if you are trust me, you can. If you are K, if you are a K twelve teacher, and you in your first year, in your second year, or in your third year, you can be dismissed from that position without cause. If your principal does not think you are doing an adequate job, you're gone. You need to be evaluated every year, and if you complete three years after principal administrative evaluations, if you complete three years, then you are granted a continuing contract. And once you have a continuing contract, you are guaranteed a contract for the next year as long as there is no decline in revenue and there have to be layoffs, and as long as you continue to be judged to be an effective principal or an effective teacher by your principal. If the principal determines that you are not an effective uh, teacher, they have to identify, they have to let you know, they have to tell you what your areas of defic deficiency are, they have to help you develop a plan of improvement, and if after 90 days you do not improve, you can be terminated. That is not tenure. Um, so, Lee, I, I don't doubt your sincerity, but I wish you'd read the contracts in most of our districts across the state and understand that there's a difference uh, between tenure, the continuing contract, and fair dismissal laws. And I agree, it would be nice to have some questions. No. Um, Christine, you want to I think the way that we'll start with questions is hopefully um, people have an opportunity to stand up and speak loudly. Um, and if that doesn't work, we can go um, to the microphone. So. First of all, thank you all for coming here and having this discussion. Uh, I know it wasn't easy. Um, our unions uh, help or hinders the teaching of our children. I think the obvious answer is both. Um, and we need to start there. Uh, one of the problems that I heard on, on both sides is uh, greed. Um, this is a piece of paper. That's all it is. That's all it is, is a piece of paper. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, I agree with you. You spoke about, I think one of the challenges in improving or removing poor teachers, that's one of the I think that's one of the big pieces that's being discussed right now, is putting in place administrators that are willing to do the work that's been established within the union contract. Like the, the piece is there to be able to put to put teachers on occupation, developing um, professional development for those teachers to improve. And you know, there are definitely there are, there are teachers that have been teaching for 20 years that just give up, that stop teaching. 
Okay, so we know that those exist. But then there's also lots of administrators that it's it's work and it's commitment to choose to move that teacher either mm -hmm. out of the profession or into a plan that improves them. And I think that discussion is, is yet to be really tackled as well. And and it's and both pieces have to be present for that to, to see really impro improvement within the current I, I would agree, and I think, you know, let's be clear, no one wants an ineffective teacher in the classroom. Uh, most certainly the teacher who teaches across the hall from that teacher. Um, and, and I think we have not had an evaluation system in the state um, that was as robust as it needed to be. And um, so that's part of the reason why um, uh, I sat down, um, WA sat down, uh, with the governor and key legislative leaders, uh, the State Board of Education and the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, and uh, based upon research, drafted new criteria for the evaluation system for both uh, teachers and principals. Because principals, uh, too, need to have a robust evaluation system. Um, we have uh, 19, 20, 21 uh, districts in the state this year that are piloting that new system. Uh, I think it's going to produce a much different way of elevating the entire profession. Frankly, I think we spend too much time worrying about the one, two, three percent of teachers that are ineffective. Way too much time. What I've always said we should do is worry about how do we get a C teacher to be a B teacher and a B teacher to be an A teacher. And how do we, because that, that's what you're really talking about. I mean, that most students have contact most years that are in school by good to great teachers. Let's get those good teachers all up to great. Um, so, and that's what I think this new evaluation system will do. It better identifies what are the qualities that you need in a very effective teacher and it better identifies what qualities a principal has to have in order to evaluate and support and, uh, and mentor those teachers. And um, I, I know that uh, we have uh, at least one person in the audience who's involved in that evaluation plot and could speak a lot more detail about this. So if we get into more uh, detail on the evaluation system, I would have to defer to Peter. I, I, and I think your question really gets at um, the heart of it. I mean, there's probably, I don't think there's a teacher's contract in this country that doesn't have a provision for firing bad teachers. What's bad about the, the layoff bill is, uh, look, and this is the fundamental disagreement. I don't think there should be any teacher layoffs, okay? Um, and, and the idea that we're going to use teacher, the, the, the excuse of teacher layoffs to start to allow administrators to start cherry picking. I mean, the, the, the amount of power that this education reform stuff wants to concentrate in the hands of single administrators in terms of cherry picking who they're going to fire and who they're not. And again, administrators are people who the overriding pressures are on them to are to do things more cheaply. And if you can fire someone who makes X dollars or someone who makes X plus ten thousand dollars, one of the things in your head is going to be I'm going to fire the, the more expensive one. Um, again, there's not a contract in the world that doesn't have some sort of provision for firing people who aren't doing their jobs um, to to then turn around and say, well, uh, the 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 problem here is that when layoffs come, you lay off the least senior people first, and that's in these contracts, and that's that's the big problem. No, the problem is that the layoffs are coming at all. Okay, we already have the biggest classrooms in the in the country. Um, we shouldn't be laying off any teachers. Um, and But to, to divert the discussion to saying, well, because principals can't do their jobs and actually fire people who aren't doing their jobs, we need to use the excuse of layoffs to get rid of, of the people who we think aren't doing their jobs, um, diverts the discussion from what should we should really be focusing on. The 1% of bad teachers in this, in this state are not nearly as much of a problem as the fact that we're going to cut a billion dollars $2 billion from K-12 education in this legislative session. That's where the discussion should be. Well, let me just start with, uh, okay, what is at issue here is this, the collective bargaining rule just says that the, that the teachers with the least seniority will be laid off first. 
Okay? So it's all the youngest teachers are going to be laid off first, and they're paid the lowest. So it's not a question of the money, as you're saying. It's a question of how long they have taught. And the union is deciding that that's the way they would like layoffs to be conducted based on seniority. So that is what will be done. The bill that is being discussed here is to allow layoffs to be based on performance so that the administrator can have the flexibility to keep his best young teacher if he's a fantastic teacher. <laughs> that's what the issue is. It, it, let me just add one thing. I mean, what kills me about the whenever whenever people want to talk about union contracts, they imagine the, the you know that the union has said layoffs. It says that, so in the contract. And the, the uh, contract was agreed to by both sides. But the court, I can quote from it's the Seattle. It's a contract between the, in, two it different says it, sides. In the Seattle Collective Bargaining if, Agreement, it says when layoffs occur, performance will not be considered. Layoffs and the management of the Seattle School District agreed to that. The people but who you want to give the power to fire Because you were threatening to, stri to strike. So what? <laughs> oh, so what? That's in violation of your contract. Uh, my question is that if you remove seniority, which is the current system, and understood and accepted by the people that are in the practice, and replace it with another system for evaluating performance to make a judgment on dismissal or hire, what would that performance measure be? And if you don't have it in your mind, it can't be a subjective decision by a principal saying good, not I think good. it should be based on student learning. I think that and the value of a teacher how, how is based, that? that's my question. based on how the children are performing in the schools, okay, under so the, on the tests. Almost 60% of the teachers in the state of Washington do not teach in a tested subject area or a summative type of environment where those, that data is incorporated into through the MSP or some okay. other There are there. a bunch of teachers that don't quite fit into that model of perfect example of some of the schools. I'm not saying teachers in those places don't do testing, because I know them and I work with them and I'm a teacher. I'm just saying that until that new system is developed or, or viewed to just sort of subvert what we're trying to do, is goes you know, against what's, what's really a good idea. Do you know what I think? I think it's a huge delay tactic by the union to not change their seniority uh, uh, method of deciding who teaches and who doesn't. That's what I think. A principal is able to use principals in private schools evaluate teachers all the time, and that's the an answer to to the gentleman before you that spoke. He, there are teachers in private schools that do that have te that do not have test scores that they evaluate them on, and that's possible to be done. Principals can evaluate the performance of a teacher whether or not there are any test scores involved. So I, I think the notion that, that, that somehow principals are going to be unfair to teachers and therefore we can't give them any authority over teachers is, is wrong and flawed. And, and so but what you're saying is, yes, if, yes there, obviously you, you have to base it, the evaluation of a teacher on the growth that he's able to achieve, right? So if this, if this if the teacher starts out with a class that is three years behind grade level, like in some of these charter schools in other states, uh, if that teacher can bring the children up one year's worth of learning, I think that 
shows that the teacher is effective and should keep their job. But you can't hold, you can't expect them to achieve three years worth of growth. But if they do, they should be able to, to get a performance bonus, and that could be a way that uh, you would you would Im you would drive improvement because you you would have a focus for energy for a school. You see, now we don't have it. It's all, we don't have enough uh, uh, impetus uh, because for improving outcomes because schools automatically get their money every year regardless of how they do. So we have to introduce some, some of these ideas that improve outcomes for students. I think that's the issue that that is at the crux of the whole performance pay. The idea that somehow teachers are holding back. <laughs> that we could do a better job, but we're choosing not to. And that somehow unions are aiding and abetting uh, teachers in holding back. And that if you only dangled some money out there, I'd suddenly work harder, you know, <coughs> do more and my kids would suddenly perform better. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, those of you who are in the College of Education, uh, I don't think you're there with the idea that if you do a little bit better, you're going to get a little bit more money. Um, that, that's just a flawed approach to public education. Um, so I think, Lee, that's at the crux of it. We have, we have a profound philosophical difference about what motivates teachers and what motivates other educators. And it really isn't the idea of paying them to have their students perform better on some tests. Um, I worked at K-12 for about 14 years, but not as, not as a teacher, but as a staff person. So my very first comment is that they, uh, special ed, by the way, administrative office. And they kept four of us, staff people busy every single day doing reports, doing Medicaid, oh. doing, I mean, just paperwork, 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 reports. But that's not my question. <laughs> so I don't have any um, real experience with charter schools, but here's what I know about private schools. A, you have to pay to go there, so right there, you're upper middle class mm -hmm. and on up. Two, if they didn't like that kid, if that kid was behaving badly, if that kid, again, special ed background, um, was defined with a handicap, they could kick that kid out. And those private schools, uh, if they did keep a child who was special ed, because they were in our school district service area, we were expected to provide SLP, OT, psychology, whatever kind of support that student needed. We had to go to that private school and support them. And then the last one was another private school that was focused on science and math. And so those parents who thought their kid was especially gifted in science and math paid, you know, at that point, I think it was 8000 a year, but, you know, I'm sure it's you know, twice that now, to have that kid there full time. Of course they will have higher scores. They're picking and choosing, using their dollars to make the choices. And public schools have to take everybody and deal with the problems from the kid who comes hungry to the class all the way up to the high achievers. And no. I agree. I agree, but but you see, the, what we argue for is increasing choices for parents, because that will drive improvements to the public schools. And the notion that because um, not giving parents a choice of a public school, like a charter school, uh, defeats parents. You see. You know, I, the, the, you often hear educators say, oh, it's not fair, parents are not doing their jobs, they're sending our kids, you know, s sending kids that are not prepared for school uh, to our schools, and then we're supposed to achieve these great results for children when they're coming with such handicaps. Well, if, if you don't allow parents' choices over where they attend, then how can you expect parents to be involved in the school when they, you know, when, when they're forced to go to an underperforming neighborhood school? How are they going to get involved and, 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 and commit to the hard work of education when you, when you force them to attend a, a school that they don't like? That's why... Your parents who care are the ones who would want to go to the charter school. 
charter school, you're still left with those parents who are poor or, or, or don't have the education themselves. They get working. But I would say the answer, the, money, the solution, the continue to shrink. I would, I would make every school a charter school. I would make every school a charter school. That would address your problem. Then everyone would have a choice to go to a charter school. A charter school is autonomous from all these oh. oppressive regulations from oppressive groups. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer. Then everyone ha would have a choice. The, the, no, because what would then happen is that the people who would get the best schools are the parents who are involved, as you put it. And the parents who are involved are the parents who have the free time and the money to be and involved. The parents now. who aren't working three jobs, the parents who aren't living in poverty, the parents who aren't living in their cars. Um, those would be the people who would win in that arrangement, okay? And, and They win in that arrangement now. There's no choices Indeed. for poor parents today. But, okay, so that's what you need to address is the poverty, not the schools. So why don't you permit charter schools in Washington State? Because that wouldn't address that problem. Oh. <laughs> So my question kind of piggytails in the back of the, excuse me, of the idea of charter schools. And what I see is that if only 19 to 20 percent of minority kids are passing math, why should the labor union have a protective right to educate these students when they're obviously failing at a very high rate? 19 to 20 percent pass rate is pretty abysmal. And so what I see is somewhat of an arrogance in not allowing charter students or charter schools to form because there is a protected interest on behalf of the seventy three million dollars that unions have invested on. I see somewhat of a protected cost there. And obviously a union would want to protect its labor, but what's preventing charter schools from actually coming in? And it seems like the labor union is a very staunch opponent to charter schools. Um, First of all, there have been three initiatives in the state on the issue of charter schools. And the voters have rejected charter schools three times. So I think that the skepticism about charter schools extends beyond uh, the Washington Education Association and the union groups. I mean, voters have voted it down three times. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at the record of uh, charters um, throughout the nation, uh, the Stanford study on that showed that there's very mixed results. There are some very good charter schools, and there are a lot of really bad charter schools. Uh, there's nothing magical about a uh, charter school suddenly becoming a better school. The reason uh, most people give, um, I'd say, maybe I shouldn't say most people, what you hear from the Obama administration and Arnie Duncan about the need for charter schools uh, focuses in on the need to promote innovation, that you need small, laboratory schools uh, to try out new ideas and then to scale them up. If we didn't have 574 innovative schools in the state, I would say there might be a need for charters. But with 574 innovative schools, any district in the state that wants to create an innovative program within the state district can do that right now. Um, most, uh, we have multiple examples of where that has been done. And, and so there really is no limit to those kind of innovations. I think that takes care uh, of the, uh, the need for any kind of innovation or experimentation. I also have a real problem with the principle of creating a school that um, is really geared toward parents, uh, affluent parents, who can provide the transportation to get their kid to the school if it's not their neighborhood school, uh, that have the ability, many charter schools require parents to work X number of hours in the building, which is a great idea, unless you're a parent that happens to have to work two or three different jobs. The idea of creating charter schools right now seems really absurd when we don't have the money to fund our schools today. To siphon the money off of our public school system and into the charter system uh, would be silly. Our state is cutting $2 billion out of public education for the next two years. That's $2,000 per child in all of our K-12 programs. 
And that doesn't include some of the cuts they're making in higher ed. So when you can't support the schools you have today, how does it make sense to try and expand that? The other thing, I do have uh, concerns about charter schools that are not under the supervision of school boards. We're going to take public dollars and put them into a charter school. They need to be under the supervision of a school board that is elected and is the, that is accountable uh, to what happens in those schools. And, and the worst thing would bring in some kind of charter school that's trying to make a profit off of our students. So I, I think those are some of the reasons why we traditionally have opposed it. But the most important thing to remember here, the voters of the state have rejected it three times. But if 19 to 20 percent of minority students are failing in math, why should there be protected labor invested in those places? Now, I, I'm, that's just not, I'm not saying the answer is charter schools. Mm -hmm. The same if 19 to 20 percent are passing there, why should labor be protected in teaching those students? So your, your assumption is that the teachers that are in those schools are somehow responsible for the student achievement. I and I would suggest that it's not that, that there are other factors in, involved there. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I would like to see more wraparound services for those, uh, for those schools, uh, that the kids who are coming to school uh, not ready to learn are getting the kind of support they need in order to come to that school and ready to learn. We also have some other issues going on here. You know, we have segments within our population that know there is no way they can afford to go to college. They don't know anybody who has graduated from college. They have no experience with that. And, uh, and it, it, there are some cultural and issues that just make it harder for them to buy into the concept of studying algebra and geometry. It just doesn't make sense in their life experience. Um, and they don't know others. I mean, those of us who grew up in, in uh, middle class and privileged homes, we don't get that. But if you don't know anybody who has benefited from, from geometry, it's pretty hard to invest the time in, in learning it, let alone all the other distractions you may have in your life. Hi, I Could you use the uh, microphone? We're videotaping, so I want to make sure your questions are heard. I, just like to bring up what you're talking about, the cultural thing. I'm actually an obviously student of color, and I want to be an educator, an elementary school teacher. And uh, so my question to you then is really, as a student of color, what are you doing? One way to get them to culturally see it is to get more, obviously, of us inside this classroom. And how, what are you guys doing to spur that more, even recruitment and whatnot? I mean, as a, I am an entrepreneurial student, I'm 30, I didn't get to school until 26. But you're right, I didn't have anyone pushing me to go to school at any at any age. So I just decided after I had a son that I needed to get back and do my own thing. So and now I, I'm an advocate for my own family. But my thinking is, well, yes, if I'm in the schools now, that's where I am. But at the same time, what kind of push are you going from the colleges to get more people of color in there? Or how are you trying to get more people of color in these schools? First of all, we aren't doing enough. I don't think anybody is, is doing enough. Um, that is a, one of the biggest problems confronting us, is how do we get more uh, kids of color, people of color, into the classroom as teachers. Um, we, um, we are working on it. Uh, we have a department within WA uh, that is working um, mainly in the greater Seattle area uh, with El Centro de la Raza, the NAACP, uh, the Urban League, and uh, a variety of other um, organizations representing co communities of color to try and encourage more students um, to go into to education. The Federal Way School District has just started a program in high school uh, to recruit kids of color to start thinking and putting themselves on the path to become teachers. But these are pretty feeble attempts. So do you put a premium on hiring or anything to encourage that on your end besides, or is it no every, everyone's equal across the board as a graduate regardless of whatnot? Yeah, we have to be very mindful of uh, laws, uh, federal laws uh, around this area. Um, I think that is a decision that local communities need to make. I would encourage uh, association and districts uh, to look at the demographics of their district and decide you know, what, how this fits on their priority list. 
Um, I could build a pretty good argument that where I taught on Mercer Island, um, we needed teachers of color in that community because otherwise uh, the students didn't see it. I think you can also build a pretty good argument that we need more uh, teachers of color in, uh, um, in Seattle where we have a high concentration of kids of color. The bottom line is we need more highly capable, talented people to be going into public education regardless of their color or ethnicity. And the current public debate around uh, education doesn't encourage people to go into education. I mean, uh, I'm hearing too many people who are saying, I'm a teacher, I'd never include, encourage anyone in my classroom to become a teacher because of all the teacher bashing today. And it's really hard for us to address some of the legitimate issues like getting teachers of color in the classroom in this environment. And a huge and barrier to teachers of color and, and first generation college students generally is going to be the increasing lack of access to public uh, state universities. Um, in the la when this legislative session is over, this university right here will have had its state funding cut by 50%. And at the end of the next two years, we will have seen our tuition go up by 60% in the last four years. Um, that continuing race to privatize our you know, access to broad-based, high-quality um, public university education is going to create tremendous barriers to people who can't afford to go to college. You had a question. Um. Uh, going back to the tricky question of teacher evaluation, I'd just be curious to hear the union folks articulate the rationale or the explanation behind um, facing uh, layoffs on seniority. First of all, I think that's an oversimplification. Um, depending upon the local contract, uh, it, there are often many other variables that go into it. And I talk about some of the schools and programs that have been exempted. But let's start with what you do in a typical high school. Kids sign up for the classes in the spring. You figure out you need X number of algebra classes, X number of American history classes, and then you look at the staff you have. So first of all, the first criteria is what is the program you're going to offer? And who are the staff that you have to fill that program? And that's true in most, call, in, in most uh, contracts. So when you start talking about RIF, the first thing you have done is place your, your teachers into the categories in which they can teach. And then if you have more teachers in a category, then, uh, um, then you have positions, then your RIF occurs in that category. I was an uh, English teacher who was RIF five years in a row. I had, at that point, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 years of experience. I was the least senior person in English and social studies. That's why I was written. Somebody who taught math and science, who was there uh, with the first or second year of their experience, they were retained because of the program our, my school offered. So it's not just uh, written within, uh, it's not straight seniority. But we do not currently have an evaluation system that is robust enough, I think, to distinguish uh, between um, who's an effective teacher and an ineffective teacher. So you don't have a system right now. Some people talk about using test scores. Well, what do you do about an art teacher, a PE teacher, a Spanish teacher, a uh, career tech teacher, that there are no tests in? So you have no basis for determining that. There's just a, you know, it's a, sim it's a simple solution to a very complex problem. And like most simple solutions, it doesn't work. Uh, can I say something? There's a couple of things that I've noticed. The, the, the inner city students who are getting 19% in math, who would most benefit from a KIPP charter school coming here, uh, the El Centro de la Raza represents uh, uh, Hispanic people. They have been given donations by the WEA. I've just been looking up their 990 forms. They are buying off the silence of these minority groups so that they don't make trouble for the WEA in Olympia and demand charter schools for their students. That's point number one. Point number two, when they say $2 billion is being cut, what is being cut are, are Initiative 728, which was the class size reduction that was passed by 
by the, uh, the electorate 10 years ago, and that and repeatedly, and Initiative 732, which is a COLA increase for teachers. That's what the $2 billion is for. Neither one of those initiatives were funded by voters, and the voters have repeatedly said that they did not want to be taxed to fund those $2 billion. So when you hear that education is being cut, what is being cut are COLA for teachers and class size reductions. But basic education is not being cut. The actual amount of money that's going to basic education will increase. No, yes. I can tell the you the state numbers. currently spends the state That's not You're, true. You are correct in the two billion dollars being cut out of the uh, K twelve budget. Eight hundred million dollars of that comes from funding of seven twenty eight, and about two hundred and fifty million dollars of it comes out of uh, seven thirty two of the COLA. The other billion is cuts in program. It's cuts in K four class size uh, funding. It's cuts in every program just about that's out there to help struggling students. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it is tremendous cuts within the program. So, uh, you know, get the facts. Right. The facts are that we will be spending more money in, in, uh, from the state this year than last year, and like we have done every year. Every year, as we've done, as we've done every year in the past. I, I guess I'm still troubled by the logic that sees. Union leadership is corrupt, and now we're seeing the leadership of El Centro de la Raza is corrupt because the, un the corrupt union leadership is supporting El Centro de la Raza, and we're supposed to be supporting um, the, uh, efforts that are trying to, to create um, better opportunities for people. Um, and yet, principles remain pristine. Principles, we never have to worry about them being corrupt. Principles, as the bosses of schools, are fully empowered, fully... Um, um, in, in, competent to be picking and choosing which teachers are going to get fired. I mean, the, 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 the demonization of leadership of, of, of teachers groups, of people of color groups, um, at, at, and at the same time um, offering no critique whatsoever of the bosses who actually run the places. Well, I absolutely think we should get rid of every um, incompetent principle. We have we have no governance in our in our schools. No one is being held accountable for their role in the schools. We have a lot of incompetent principles, and they should be fired. And we should get bet great principles in every one of our schools, and that would and get great teachers in every one of our schools, and we would improve education in Washington State. We don't have that. We have principles unions. Which, are, which protect principals from being fired. We have teachers' unions that protect teachers from being fired. We have no accountability in our school system, and that is why we have such poor results. There's only one school district where the principals are unionized, and that's in Seattle. Okay, fine. I just say, but no, I totally agree. All the research shows that if you have a great principal leading your school, you have great results for students. And so I strongly agree that we need better principals and that they should have more authority and autonomy and uh, a, accountability over running their schools. And that's what you find in high quality charter schools across the nation. That's what you have. Find principals who are able to organize their teachers and, and drive money to the classroom and improvement for students. But the teachers' union says we can't have charters in our state. The last time we voted, by the way, was 2004. That's seven years ago. There's been a lot of data out there produced on showing the results of high-quality charter schools. So the voters deserve another right to vote on charter schools. I bet you would pass today. But no, the union won't permit it. The union won't permit it. Right? And th this notion that the union is somehow this dictatorial government. It's, I mean, it is the An initiative process. Policy. I mean, if the union couldn't permit stuff, we would have. There would have been a lot different elections than than some of the stuff. You know, Tim Iman's initiatives wouldn't be on the ballot. I mean, what in in, in what the, sense? The union, uh, the union in this state decides education policy. I think we could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if that were true, there'd be a lot more money in it. I mean. <laughs>
will um, guava for pulling this together. And thank you all for coming. And um, I, I really expect all of you to um, stay connected to these issues and look at the work that's continuing to be done by our panelists. Um, and uh, I think, if anything, um, vote to become active citizens within this democracy. <laughs> yes. Thank you.